Good morning, everybody. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Glad to have you here this morning. And I, I just happen to notice that all the native New York Staters are here this morning. <laughs> as well as the native Wyoming people are all here this morning. For the rest of us, it's a little cold. What's that? <laughs> A few Texans sprinkled in. Good. Well, I'm glad you made it out on this cold morning, and welcome to everyone joining us on Zoom this morning as we worship. Uh, let's stand as you're able, and we'll join in our opening song.
Would you join with me in the call to worship taken from the language of Psalm 139? Praise God, who made each of us and all of us. Praise God, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The Holy One knows each of us, actions and thoughts. The Creator wraps us in tender care. So we rejoice, waking or sleeping, we know God is with us. Honor the one who knows us and leads us in the everlasting way. seated. Would you join with me in our prayer of confession? O oh Lord, you have known us. Your knowledge and love are not punctuated by starts and stops. You have always known us, known where we've been, what we've been through. You know the joys and the dark places. You know when we've walked and when we've been too exhausted to walk. You know where we've hidden and where we have run to. You know our thoughts and our actions, every moment of silence and every moment of selfishness. Such knowledge is beyond our ability to comprehend. We might pull away, feeling too known or vulnerable, but we will trust you instead you who created us, who seek to redeem us, and to heal us and make us whole. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. Point out anything in us that offends you, and guide us on the road to life. We rest this morning in the knowledge that God knows us and that God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, not to condemn, but to save. Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. Amen. Listen to 
of Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. Hey kids, how many of you have trouble remembering people's names? It's not uncommon for us to meet someone, be introduced to them, and then promptly have their name go out of our minds. One of the tricks that is sometimes recommended to, remembers people, to remember people's names is to try and say that person's name out loud three times in the first conversation you have with them. This can be kind of awkward. However, when you remember someone's name, it can mean a lot to them. It can change their day. Did you know that God knows your name? Names are important to God, so God knows everyone's name. Imagine that. Imagine knowing the name of everyone in the whole world who has ever lived. God must have a really great memory, huh? The Bible has a lot of examples of people being called by name to do God's work. In Exodus, God called Moses from within the burning bush. In Luke, Jesus called Zacchaeus, telling him to come down from the tree. In Acts, we hear how God called Paul by his given name of Saul. And in the passage we are reading from today in 1 Samuel chapter 3, God calls a boy named Samuel by name. Samuel has an interesting story that we aren't really getting into today, so I'm going to fill you in a little bit. Samuel's mother, Hannah, wanted a son more than anything in the world, so she prayed and asked God to give her one. Hannah promised God that if God would give her a son, she would give that son back to God to serve God all the days of his life. God gave Hannah the son she asked for, and she kept her promise to God. When the boy was old enough, she took him to the temple and presented him to Eli, the priest. So Samuel served in the temple under Eli. Our story today starts here. One night, Samuel was sleeping when he heard someone call his name. He got up and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called for me. And Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel goes back to bed. He starts to fall asleep again. And again, God calls Samuel. And Samuel jumps out of bed and runs to Eli and says, You called me. Here I am. Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And just as Samuel is falling asleep for a third time, he hears his name called, and he gets up and runs to Eli and says, here I am, you called me. Finally, Eli realizes that it was God who's calling Samuel. And he tells Samuel, go and lie down. And if someone calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel went back to bed, and sure enough, he heard the voice of God calling, Samuel, Samuel. And this time, Samuel answered as Eli told him, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Sometimes, as kids, it feels like God only pays attention to grown-ups and grown-up stuff. But Samuel was a kid when God called him. God knows how kids are listening and learning and how their hearts are humble and willing to do God's work in ways that sometimes adults adults can't or won't. God still calls boys and girls today, saying, come, follow me. So listen. Listen for God's call and answer just as Samuel did. Here I am. God might surprise you with the amazing things you can do, even when you're a kid. Will you pray with me? Loving God, Here we are. Help us to quiet the many loud voices in the world around us and listen for your still, quiet voice calling to us. Through you, we can walk the path you have laid for us and live out the love and grace of Christ in our daily lives. In your name we pray. Amen. This is the time in our service when when the kids can come upstairs with me for godly play. I promise I can talk. I'm having a hard day with it.
want to take just a moment to draw attention to a few announcements. Uh, one, coming up right after the service, we're going to start a little Sunday school study on idols, the thing you've been wondering about all week, I know. But the, you know, the Bible makes a big deal about idols. Second, first and second commandments are all about what is the appropriate way to represent God or not. And uh, as Western thinkers, we're okay with thinking about God is here even though I can't hear, smell, touch, taste, or feel him. Right? So how do we know God is here? Well, for ancient people, that was a pretty hard concept. You have to have tangible ways of knowing God is here. And the idols are a big part of that. And so what are the appropriate ways of representing God's presence? And what are the inappropriate ways? So if that spikes your interest at all, come. If it doesn't, come anyway. So that'll be after worship. Next week after worship will be our annual meeting. Uh, so if there's any groups or folks that uh, usually submit a report to be a part of that, we need that in the next day or two. Uh, there are bylaw changes a part of this year's meeting, and those have been gone out in the midweek update for you to review, and there's hard copies on the table out there if you'd like to review them there as well. There's another announcement in the bulletin that is new, and that is on February 10th, sponsored by the Worship and Spiritual Growth team, we're having a concert, so another little concert in our series, uh, featuring very various voices and talents. So that will be February 10th in the evening. I encourage you to, we'll have flyers available this week. If you want to put them somewhere in the community, invite folks to join us. That would be great. Are there other announcements that need attention? Oh, I guess I should add, this afternoon is a memorial service for Ken Stabler at 3 p.m. right here. Any others? Steve? Men's breakfast Thursday. Men's breakfast Thursday, 7.30 at Bread and Butters. Join us if you'd like. Love to have you. All right. Any others? Let us join in our time of prayer then as we lift up our joys and concerns. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we uh, give thanks for your presence in our lives, that you are with us and accessible. Uh, and we pray that you will continue to teach us how to trust you and to walk with you and to turn to you in all circumstances. And today we turn to you especially for those in health who are having health issues, for others who are going through health complications and, and difficult times or sadness uh, with the, the changing of seasons, we just lift them up today. Ask for your strength and presence to be with them. Continue to guide us, we pray, as we follow you. We pray now the words that your Son taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today's poem is by Jana Kalena, who, is, um, who lives with her husband on, in, um, off of the Canadian coast. When forever really felt like it. When I was a kid, I didn't know when summer was, didn't know that solace, solace, <laughs> was the beginning of its end, hours of daylight in which to play, filled with the cares of our lives, folded over each other like soft ice cream overflowing its cone, mouth-watering, anticipation conditioned by the truck tinkling sounds, a music box on wheels that could be heard winding its way through the neighborhood, approaching slowly like adulthood, a tantalizing promise much sweeter from afar. Such creamy white coolness, still refreshing, but richer now for the memories of days when calendars 
were just pretty pictures, not a measure of the seconds of our lives. Beautiful. Prayer for illumination. Father God, we come to you as innocent, trusting children. Lord, help us to see you. Help us to hear you and your word. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Wrong book. Our first reading today is from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3, 1 through 20. And uh, Cassie told us some of this story, but I will tell you again. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At the time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down on the, in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. And go, lie down again. So he went to lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again, the third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knows because his sons were blasphemy God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offerings forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hid anything from me of all he told you. But Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall on the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, 
knew that Samuel was trustworthy, a trustworthy prophet of the Lord, the Lord continued to appear to at Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. And in the New Testament, we're reading from Matthew 18, 1 through 5 true greatness. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them. The little children were being brought to him in order that he might lay his hand on them and pray. The disciples spoke sternly to those who brought them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not stop them for it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. And he laid his hands on them and went on his way. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So if I say to you, you're acting like a child. Do you take that as a compliment or an insult? Compliment. <laughs> or if, you have, if I say, what a baby, compliment or insult? Probably insult. Uh, is it good to be childish or in what ways? Certainly there's a lot of aspects of childish behavior that we don't consider to be particularly positive or redeeming. Generally, I would say, that an adult acting like a child is not something we would aspire to, certainly not something easy to deal with in a committee meeting. And yet, Jesus repeatedly lifts up children as being both special to him and also suggesting that they possess certain qualities that we must take on ourselves. That unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter or really conceive of the kingdom of God. And Jesus will even tell Nicodemus that you've got to be born again. Start fresh. Start right over. How many of you are ready to go back to youth or childhood willingly? Based on a number of conversations I've had recently, it doesn't sound like many are too thrilled about that prospect. There are many aspects of childhood that we'd rather not relive. You know, teenage life and all the insecurities or you know, the vulnerabilities or being scared or whatever it is. You know, our therapists would say many of our traumas and tendencies stem from those years, meaning it, it was challenging at times. And additionally, there's a lot we've learned over the years that we would rather not unlearn and have to go through certain lessons again, to have to repeat certain things. So there is much that is unappealing about going back to our youth. So we come to this question, what are the qualities of being a child that Jesus seems to think are essential to entering and participating in the kingdom of God. Now, we talked about this on Tuesday morning at our coffee and conversation, and some of the qualities we lifted up were things like innocence or humility, trust, openness, vulnerability. We talked about a willingness and a desire to learn. You know, when you're a kid, you have everything to learn. You're constantly absorbing you, uh, you, we are malleable. There's a teachableness, perhaps. Well, we can infer these qualities, partly because of these other statements Jesus will make to his disciples, you know, calls to follow, such as leaving your family and influences, or taking up your cross, or selling everything you have to come follow, or leaving your nets. Like, there are all these calls to start fresh, to let go of what you know and are obligated to, to, to step into this place where you're willing to follow, to learn, to be taught, this newness, malleableness. And this stands in contrast to the tendencies as we age, which are often in that we get set in our ways, set in our thinking. It's hard to change the way we see the world to some degree. Now, again, we have to infer these things a little bit from Jesus' statements because he doesn't spell them out super specifically. And we also may notice that we don't have any stories in the Gospels, really, where this is exemplified. 
Children are not actors in the stories. They don't speak. In fact, they are talked about and spoken for, which is part of that experience of being a child that we might not care for. Not being asked what we want, being told what we want or need. And so it's interesting in our Old Testament reading that we get this narrative that illustrates perhaps the qualities that Jesus might be referring to. We get a story where a child is actually an actor and a speaker in the story. And in that story, the elder of the story, Eli, has gotten like older adults tend to get, set in his ways, not as open to new ideas or possibilities, has been doing the same thing for a long time. His kids are grown and set in their ways, spoiled rotten brats from what it sounds. His eyes are not working like they used to. Anyone relate to that? And so, when God wants to do something new, he calls, but he doesn't speak to Eli, the one who's he is de- described as, as kabed, heavy, meaning of stature and status. Like he's, he's the elder in the community. He's the priest. He's the, the judge, the one of substance. But that's not who God speaks to. Because he's too set in his ways. And as Cassie reminded us, Samuel is this child gifted to Hannah who was barren and who would come to the temple praying, at, to the temple at Shiloh, praying regularly for a child. And so Samuel is born and she offers him back to the Lord, meaning he serves at the temple, assisting in rituals and services. And in biblical language, when a, when a child is born out of barrenness, that's a way of saying God is doing something new, a new chapter is starting. But, or, or maybe accent, accentuating that, the story is prefaced by the fact that we hear this phrase a few times, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. I mean, they hadn't really seen these obvious signs of God in a while. They've settled into rhythms. And this is the backdrop, and, and Samuel's still young, and he doesn't yet know the Lord. And so our passage makes it clear that that Eli is past the point of God ready to work with him. He's, he's too old. He's lost his uh, fervency, perhaps. And his sons have carried on the work of being priests, but they are corrupt and callous and deaf to the word of the Lord. It says that they profane the sacrifices. They basically took all the sacrifices and had big feasts, uh, slept with the temple servants. They're a general nuisance, basically. And Eli has not kept them in order. But I suspect young Samuel doesn't understand any of that. I mean, you're impressionable as a child, like you grow up and you assume what's around your family is normal. And then you get to an age and you realize, wait a second, my family wasn't normal? Anyone ever come to that realization? Well, he grows up and this is what he, he knows. He's impressionable. And he respects and looks up to Eli. And Eli, too, was once young and sincere and dedicated and bright-eyed and eager, but now he's described as old and dim in the eyes and not receptive or perceptive. And so into all this, God calls to Samuel as he's lying down one night in the temple, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel responds in the pattern of a call narrative, meaning when God finds someone who is a potential servant, and he calls to them, and the appropriate response is, just as Samuel says, here I am. You called me. This willingness and openness to be called upon and to respond to whatever is requested. The only problem is, he says it to Eli. So it's like the confidential papers have fallen into the hands of the the bad people. And they're going to shred the evidence, so to speak. That's a little dramatic. But, but you get the idea. Eli has this chance to shape the message. Because Samuel comes to Eli. And God calls Samuel's name. But God's voice and Eli's voice sound pretty much the same to Samuel. So he assumes Samuel or Eli is calling him. And so he goes to Eli, of course, as Cassie already recounted for us, that he He sends him back to bed and says, you know, knock it off, go back to sleep and stop waking me up. But again, it happens three times. Each time Samuel goes to Eli, assuming that the voice calling him was Eli. And in the realization, all of a sudden Eli now realizes what's happening. 
And he instructs Samuel. It reads, Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. And he tells him, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. It's a powerful moment in this story. Because Eli, generally, the general assessment is he's over the hill and a problem. And yet, he has not completely lost his sensibility here, has he? He continues to be God's voice to Samuel, instructing Samuel. He could have inserted himself and spoken for God in that moment to make sure Samuel doesn't hear something contradictory from the Lord. He could have interpreted God's wishes for the young boy, but he does not. Instead, what does he do? He instructs Samuel in how to listen to the Lord. I find it a lovely bit of complexity because Samuel is, though open, he's still impressionable. He doesn't know how to hear from the Lord, and so he turns to Eli to do so. But in listening, he will surpass Eli. And if we were to think of Samuel and Eli as kind of representing parts of ourselves that we might identify with, Eli is that managing part that has helped you navigate life, that has a level of control, that has navigated the chaos, has monitored the mail, has taken care of different circumstances, tried to exert a certain control over the variables of life, protecting people and institutions. But we also have a Samuel part, a part that is curious and open and willing to experience something new if we allow that part of us to be curious and free and to step towards the new. And so Samuel does as Eli instructed. And when the Lord calls to him the next time, he says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And then Samuel gets an earful all about how God is going to punish Eli's house. Can you imagine how big his eyes were at that moment? Whoa, that's a lot for a kid to take on. It must have been an awkward moment at the breakfast table when Samuel comes out, and then Eli's question is, what did he say to you? And Samuel responds like a teenager, nothing. But then Eli puts the screws in, uses the idiom of, a, of an oath. God help you if you do not tell me everything he said. It's like you fess up. And so it's yet another moment when Eli could squash what Samuel heard. After all, can you imagine you know, being Samuel, of having to hear this and then tell Eli what he heard? Watch Eli's face grow red and angry. But once again, Eli shows his redeeming qualities. Samuel tells Eli everything, and Eli responds with a willingness to accept rather than to edit or to squash or to fight it or to exert control over Samuel. Eli says, it's the Lord. Let the Lord do what seems good to him. And so in that moment, Eli shows this childlike quality himself, doesn't he? this openness, this willingness to hear, to not be directed by shame or honor or these other values, this willingness to face the future with humility and to let God work as God sees fit. In his humility, Eli takes on a new role. He's not the center of God's work anymore. He doesn't get to direct it or teach it. He doesn't really have respect or honor that he's used to, but he becomes a new figure of humility, facing his own truths, playing a role in Samuel's life, which is to teach him how to discern the voice of the Lord. And so even in moments of life, when, when life and hopes and expectations go off the rails a little bit, as they did for Eli, when we lose control, which is the experience of a child, There's still work for us to do. There's a a role to play, perhaps, if we can adjust and be open and adapt to it, even as Eli does. And I wonder if, as we grow older and presumably wiser, if wisdom is knowing that we cannot actually direct the next generation. This is the thing we struggle with in the church. 
right? We, we want it to continue in the same way it's been, and yet culture is shifting dramatically. We cannot fully anticipate what it will mean for someone else to follow the Lord. And perhaps our job, like Eli, is to model humility, to model how to listen to the Lord and to follow, to take up the posture of Samuel ourselves, a willingness to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And so when Jesus is recruiting followers and being confronted by religious leaders who are not particularly open, and he says, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, or that whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Maybe it's the qualities we see in Samuel and even those positive qualities of Eli that is something of what Jesus is lifting up and referring to. Now, there's one more aspect of being coming like a child that we talked about on Tuesday morning. It's the fact that while we would likely not choose to go back to childhood, we inevitably do. For the course of life is such that we grow, as we grow closer to the end of our lives, we begin to lose the independence we gained in adulthood. We start to forget and not remember all the things that we learned, including the name of the person standing in front of us sometimes. Or our eyes grow dim, even as Eli's do, and we start to become dependent again on loved ones to pay attention to us and guide us and to help us read labels and understand what the doctor is saying. Now, you may not want to be reminded of that, or you may be trying to fight that off as long as you possibly can. But I wonder, I wonder if we are drifting that way naturally, maybe there is something in that for us to learn. That rather than fighting it, might help us discover the kingdom afresh to connect with and hear God anew. For while there is much of childhood we would not want to repeat, perhaps we can choose to seek those qualities of openness and trust and humility. Because when God wants to work in new ways, when a new chapter is beginning, he seeks out those who are able to listen and to discern like a child or someone willing to leave their nets, or some similar thing. Those who are open and not so firmly set in their ways. So maybe we can try to take on Samuel's posture, which he picked up, learned from Eli. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our hymn.
You may be seated. As you go out this morning, I invite you to place your tithes and offerings in the offering box on the back table. Let us pray. Lord, receive the gifts that we have to offer to you. For you call us to follow and to submit our lives to your purposes. So use us, Lord, we pray. Use our time and our efforts and our gifts and our resources. Bless them. Use them for your work here among us and around the world, we pray. Amen. As we go this morning, let us go always in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Creator, and the fellowship of the Spirit with us now and forevermore. Amen.